Hello, you're ready for another lesson in our information technology series on your practical assessment task or PAT? Some learners find the PAT quite intimidating, but if you follow the steps I suggest every lesson, you'll see the process is quite logical. The PAT is divided into three phases. We've already learned about phase one, research and analysis. In the last lesson, we started phase two and learned about program specifications. Today's lesson will be the first part of algorithms. Ah, Tabo has arrived. Morning, Tabo. Morning, Mr. Kumalo. Any progress with your pet? Mm, definitely. I've listed all the events we could think of. Now, can we start with programming? <laughs> I admire your enthusiasm, Tabo. Mm, I sense a bad coming up. <laughs> but we still have some preparation to do. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to break an event down into its component steps, clearly showing sequence, selections, and iteration, or repetition. In the previous lesson, we listed the events in our practical assessment task. Today, we're going to work out what tasks the program must perform during each event, and write instructions for each of these tasks. You know what an algorithm is, right? Yes, it's step-by-step -step instructions to get a job done. Yes, an algorithm is a solution to a problem and can be written in pseudocode. I know about program code, which is commands or instructions for a program. But what's pseudocode? Pseudocode is like writing commands or instructions without using a specific programming language. Mm. A computer can read a program code, but pseudocode is designed to be read by humans. Meaning plain old English. Very close. It uses English words, but it uses programming language structures. That means the syntax or sentence structure of pseudocode is similar to program code. It's easy to translate an algorithm in pseudocode into any program language. Let's summarize the differences. Program language or code is very formal. It uses strict syntax rules it uses program control structures like the sequence, selections, and iteration. Pseudocode is less formal, has no strict rules for syntax, meaning sentence structure, but it uses program control structures for sequence selection and iteration. Each step in the algorithm is an instruction that describes what the program must do during an event. Like getting input and giving output. Yes. The steps in an algorithm give instructions that describe input, processing, the storing of data, and output. We don't name any computer devices like the keyboard or the monitor or any GUI components in an algorithm. But we do specify storage locations like database, text files, or object in RAM. These instructions usually follow the same pattern, almost like a formula. The format of an instruction is usually do what, where, with the where being optional. Let's look at an example. Take the login instruction. What does the user have to do where? The user has to input his name and get a password. Yes. If we had to write an instruction, it would look something like this. The input name will be do what, get password from object will be do what where, store address in the database will be do what where. These instructions are given in a logical order from start to finish. We say they are in sequence. To show sequence, we write the instructions in the order in which they must be done. Instructions in an algorithm must be in sequence. Instruction 1, instruction 2, instruction 3, and so on. 
algorithms generally include selection of instructions and repetition of instructions. Selection means the program has to select one set of instructions to follow if a given condition is true, and a different set of instructions to follow if the condition is false. Repetition means the set of instructions must be repeated. To show selection, we write if, when the condition is true, then do one set of instructions, or else, if the condition is false, do a different set of instructions. To show repetition, we write one of the following. Repeat a certain number of times instructions. Repeat until a given condition is true instructions. Repeat until a given condition is false instructions. Let's look at an event like tea making and see what instructions to give. The event involves making tea for three people who all take two spoons of sugar and milk in their tea. If you had to break this event down and list the actions or tasks in the simplest possible way, what would it be? That's easy. Check if there is water in the kettle. If there isn't, you open the kettle, add water, replace the lid, then you switch on the kettle. Carry on. Get a cup, get another cup, get another cup. Get a spoon, get sugar, or put a spoonful of sugar in the first cup. Put another spoonful of sugar in the first cup. Put milk in the first cup. Put tea bag in the first cup. Let's stop it there. You've just created an algorithm. Did you notice that each statement used a verb to give an instruction? Yes. Do this, do that. If this is true, do this. Otherwise, do that. <laughs> Exactly. What else did you notice? There is a lot of repetition. Yes. It's important to identify the repetition. If you do it now and write a clear algorithm, it will make programming a lot easier later. We use indentation to show which instructions are involved in the repetition or iteration. By indenting the instructions, I can easily see which instructions must be repeated just by looking at the algorithm. It would look something like this. Repeat instruction 1, instruction 2, instruction 3. Next instruction, not included in the repetition. Let's write down the algorithm for the tea making event. We first check if there's water in the kettle, if there isn't water. And now I use indentation to indicate that the next three tasks are only done if the condition there is no water in the kettle is true. Remove the lid, add water, replace the lid, switch on the kettle. Notice that there are two tasks we have to do. Can you tell me what they are? Checking the water and switching on the kettle. Yes, switching on the kettle is not conditional. We don't only switch it on if there was water in it when we first checked it. Remember, we're making tea for three people. We need three cups and two spoons of sugar per cup, as well as milk in every cup. That means we repeat certain actions. To indicate the repetition or iteration, we use indentation again. Repeat three times. Get cup. Get spoon. This is not repeated, so it's not indented. We are going to use one spoon. Repeat three times so that we can add sugar, milk, and tea bag to the three cups. Repeat two times. Put spoonful of sugar in cup. Put milk in cup. Put tea bag in cup. The next instruction might be to add water to the cups. Notice how we show that we put two spoons of sugar in each of the three cups. Although I have only shown one of the three commands for repetition, remember that there are no strict rules for pseudocode. You may also use for or while commands for your repeat loops if you know which one you need. Now it's easy to see that an algorithm is a sequence of instructions that must be followed. Some instructions are selected only if a certain condition is met, and some instructions must be carried out more than once.
these three sequence, selections and iteration or repetition are the program control structures. They control the way a program works. Let's look at the same example. The algorithm runs in sequence from start to finish. First check for the water in the kettle. Then switch on the kettle. Don't switch on the kettle before you check for water. You can't put in sugar and tea bags before you get the cups. The algorithm can include selection. If there is no water, then the following tasks must be done. Remove the kettle lid, add water and replace the lid. And repetition or iteration, for example, getting three cups. We also repeat twice for each of the three times the action of adding a spoon of sugar to a cup. To make programming easier later, it's important to write an algorithm for each of the events in your pat. Okay, um, let's see if I got this right. I'll have to break each event into tasks and write an instruction for each task. That will tell the computer what it must do to handle the input, output, processing and storage for that event. Perfect. You could start by looking at input and output instructions. Input from the user via a keyboard or mouse and output to the monitor or printer is usually stored temporarily in variables in RAM. We will look at how to deal with variables later in the lesson. The user interacts with input and output components on the GUI using peripherals or input and output devices. Do we have to mention GUI components in our algorithms? No, Tabo. Remember that you are using pseudocode, not a programming language. Mm, what about the devices? No devices or GUI components, only storage components. We want to keep the algorithm clear and concise. But if we use a limited number of verbs in a consistent way, we can clearly show which device is involved in the task. Here's an example. If input or output involves the user, we say input and input selected. This means put the data the user provides in input components into the RAM. We also use the verb display, which means display the data in the RAM in the output components on the monitor. Oh, I get it. The verbs in the algorithm indicate the devices or components involved. Select must imply the use of the keyboard or mouse. Yes. And remember that input and output both involve moving data between the RAM and the user. Here are some examples of input and output instructions for transferring data between the user and RAM. Input indicates that data must be moved from an input component into the RAM. The device is the keyboard. Input selected indicates that data must be moved from an input component into the RAM. The device is the mouse. Display indicates that data must be moved from the RAM into an output component where the device is the monitor. We have three very brief instructions that are easy to understand. Input username uses the keyboard and an input component, like this here. Input selected grade uses the mouse and an input component, like this. Display welcome message uses the monitor and an output component, like the screen. What other input or output devices can be used where the GUI components are not needed? The printer, I think. Or sound. It can play sound or record sound. Yes. The verbs we use for other input or output devices when the GUI components are not needed are print message. Output must go to the printer. Play sound. Output must go to the speakers. Record sound. Input must come from the microphone. To summarize, when data is transferred between the user and RAM, we indicate it as follows. 
Input username. Input selected grade. Display message. And when data is transferred between the device and RAM, we use print message, play correctly pronounced word, record voice, or other sound. Some input and output or movement of data for an event does not involve the user. It will be between the RAM and permanent storage, such as a database or text file. How would we indicate that? If you consistently use fetch and store to refer to databases, the instruction will be simple but understandable. Here's an example. For data transfer between database storage and RAM, you could use fetch password, where data moves from the database into the RAM, and store password, where data moves from the RAM into the database. So we have to use specific verbs in our algorithms. While it's easier, there are no strict rules, so you could also say input password, but then you must add from database. You can state the instruction in any way that a human will understand it, but you must be consistent in your instructions. If you say input password, it means the user must provide the password. If you say fetch password, it means the database must provide the password. Any suggestions on what we can use for data stored in text files? Remember, we can either read data from the text file or write data to the text file. Oh, to move data from the text file into RAM, read. And to move data from RAM into a text file, write? Yes. Well, now we have an idea of how to show instructions for input, output, and permanent storage during an event. In the next lesson, we'll take a look at how to show processing instructions. For now though, try today's task. In the following scenario, think of what must be done without considering any special strategy, like always start in the middle square. A game of noughts and crosses is played by two players. One person places a knot in any square. Then the other places a cross. The first person to get three of their symbols in a line, row, column, or diagonal, wins the game. 1. List the instructions for the game, showing sequence and repetition only. 2. Show the selection or if statement that was used for the move, where X placed a symbol to try prevent naught from winning in the bottom right square. Remember to cater for a normal move. 3. The next move is shown in green. X is going to lose, as he can only block one of the two squares, shown by a small b. Adapt your if statement for this condition, making sure it caters for all other conditions.